Earlier, I gave an overview of what synchronization was and talked about how it's used to address certain inherent complexities of Java or concurrent programs, concurrent Java programs. And now what we're going to do is start going into more discussion about the Java synchronizer classes. And there's a whole bunch of them. And so we'll talk about some of the synchronizers that, that are defined in Java. And I'll also talk about some of the usage considerations, when to choose certain synchronizers over others. And there's almost always a, a trade-off in terms of performance or productivity uh, and, and so on. So let's first start talking about what Java provides us. So it turns out that the Java synchronization classes can be split into several capabilities, or maybe better term is categories of capabilities. So one thing we have are so-called atomic operations, which are actions that either happen all at once or don't happen at all, right? So like transporter beam. Second is mutual exclusion, which allows concurrent access and updates to shared data without incurring race conditions and other hazards like inconsistent memory visibility and memory um, model issues. And the third thing is coordination, which ensures that computations run properly, meaning in the right order, at the right time, under the right conditions, and so on and so forth. And then there's also this concept of barrier synchronization, which means that groups of threads have to stop at a certain point in the control flow, and none of them can proceed until all the other threads that are part of the group reach the same barrier. So a good example is like uh, you know, a horse racing where you start out with the starting gate. As you'll see as we go through this class, we're actually, when all is said and done, most likely to spend more time on synchronization and all the synchronization mechanisms in Java than we will on threading. And there's a reason for this. And one of the reasons is that whenever you start having things that are running concurrently, one of the big challenges is how to coordinate them all. And that turns out to be rather tricky. Um, and I think we can experience this in everyday life. Anybody know, want to guess where this might be? And it's not uh, Interstate I-65 at rush hour, although sometimes it feels that way. So this, I think this is somewhere in India. Um, and not to pick on India, it's just I've been there before, and it actually looks like that. Uh, I was in Bangalore and Hyderabad several years ago, and uh, it was amazing to me the relatively small number of accidents you have, given the fact that people pretty much drive like this all the time. And I think that people who are drivers in India have some kind of special ESP that allows them to have situational awareness around their cars. And they get like this close, and they don't quite hit. It's really amazing. Quite, quite fascinating. Now, as it turns out, the reason why this is complicated is because we're coordinating the interactions of entities that run concurrently. As we'll see later, and certainly if you take the sister course in the, the fall, next fall, when you start using the parallelism frameworks, a lot of this complexity disappears because we end up rearranging the way our programs are structured to use a divide and conquer approach. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about that in this class, but that's really more for the parallelism discussion. So let's start by talking about Java atomic classes briefly, and I'm going to give you a deeper dive into atomics. So Java supports a bunch of atomic operations on objects. And one type of thing that they support are these things called atomic variables. And we'll, we'll go into this in more detail because you need to know it for the spin lock portion of your assignment for 1B. But basically what this does is it provides so-called lock-free, thread-safe operations on a single variable, or a single, you, know, you have multiple variables, but one at a time. So for example, atomic long and atomic boolean and atomic integer, there's a whole bunch of these things, atomic reference, all support these atomic operations that under the hood use this compare and swap technique in order to make them work very fast without ever having to put the calling thread to sleep. So we have operations for doing things like incrementing and decrementing longs, um, being able to do compare and set, which you'll be using for your programming assignment, and, and other stuff like that. So it's basically a way of being able to treat a long value or an integer or a Boolean or whatever in an atomic fashion with respect to the operations that they need to support. Something else that they provide, something called a long adder, and that allows multiple threads to update a common sum efficiently under high contention. And this would be used for things like you know, a, hit, a web page hit counter in a web server, where you are going to have lots of threads updating this variable, and you want to make it eventually consistent, but you want to do it really efficiently. 
in order to be able to minimize the time that is spent in the critical section. There's also a pile of synchronizer classes, and these are all what are part of the Java Util Concurrent Locks package, and there's also a bunch of stuff in Java, uh, Java Util Concurrent. Um, the stuff that we talked about here with Atomics are in Java uh, Util Concurrent Atomics. So here are the classes where I'm gonna talk about these briefly, and then we're gonna go and look at them all in more detail, starting with Semaphore, because that's the next thing on the queue. And I'll give you lots and lots of examples when we get into the details. These synchronizers are used all over the place in Java applications and class libraries. So probably the simplest synchronizer is something called a Rantrant Lock. And this supports what's called mutual exclusion or a mutex. Mutual exclusion mutex is the acronym. And it essentially extends the built-in monitor lock capabilities that come as part of the Java language. So the Java language and virtual machine support these very low level mechanisms called synchronized statements or synchronized methods. And Rantrant Lock is a little bit more, um, gives you a little bit more fine-grained control and a bit more operations than you get out of the box with the real simple synchronized statements and methods. Reentrant means that the thread that holds the lock can reacquire it without deadlocking on itself. And you'll see that with assignment 1B. If you're implementing the grad student version, then you have to implement a reentrant spin lock. So reentrant is important. And it's just a way of optimizing for the case where you have to have recursiveness in your lock hierarchy. And there are certain situations where that's important. One of the key things about a reentrant lock is it has to be fully bracketed. And that's why I always use the example from the airplane restroom to illustrate what I mean by a reentrant lock, so or mutual exclusion. So in the restroom at an airplane, you have the little you know, occupied available slider. And the protocol is if it's available, uh, then you can go ahead and go in. And as soon as you go in, you shut it. That becomes occupied. And the person who's using the facilities is the same person who unlocks it. Right? So that's what's called fully bracketed. The, the thread, the being, the person who acquires the lock is also the thread being person who releases it. So all that means is that it's going to have to have this special relationship. And the reason I make this distinction is some other synchronizers don't have that fully bracketed, bracketed requirement. Retrant locks are, are very, very, very efficient. They use uh, some things we'll talk about later called compare and swap operations and, and often don't have to sleep, which is good. There's then another kind of lock called a reentrant read-write lock, which is sort of this mutual exclusion concept on steroids, hence the little you know, syringe. So it's kind of pumping it up with more stuff. And it's used to improve performance for situations where a resource is read way more often than written to. And one kind of simple example you may be familiar with is in, in uh, Vanderbilt, we have a course catalog, which changes, you know, Maybe once a year we add new courses, we remove old, old courses, we change prerequisites, whatnot. But 99.99999% of the time, it's not going to change. So you would potentially protect this kind of a thing with a read-write lock where lots of people can be simultaneously reading it. And only on the rare occasion when it changes must a write lock be acquired to ensure exclusive access while the content is changed. So that, that's what a reader, writer, uh, reader's writer lock is. And there's something called a reentrant read-write lock. This has lots and lots of features, which is both a blessing and a curse. It's mostly a curse because it means it's not very efficient. So you can do all these things with reentrancy, lock downgrading, interrupts, condition support, blah, 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 but it's really slow. So for that reason, in Java 8, they introduced a new reader's writer lock synchronizer called a stamp lock. And you'll get a chance to play around with that later. It's really cool. And it's basically a reader's writer lock that's much more efficient than a reentrant read write lock, even though it doesn't have as many features. What it does have is something called optimistic reads. And that's most useful in situations where you have lots of threads and perhaps lots of cores, but relatively low contention. So often it's the case that even though you, um, so you want to make it so that people can read from data optimistically, assuming there was no contention. And only if there was, in fact, contention, 
do you then do something else in order to acquire the lock? So the bulk of the time, there's really little or no overhead to using the read portion of the stamp lock. It's only in the rare case where contention occurs. Something else that's supported by stamp lock that's pretty cool is something called lock upgrading. So it's possible to have a lock that's held for reading. So you're just a read-only access. And then for whatever reason, you want to make a change to something, and you can try to upgrade the lock to a write lock. And if there's no contention, again, it's very fast. Only if there's contention do you have to, to wait or block. So we'll talk about stamp lock, and you get a chance to play around with that. It's pretty cool. So that's another example of mutex on steroids. Next um, example, uh, semaphores. You'll get a chance to play around with these in the assignment 1B. And what they do is they maintain a count of permits that control the number of threads that can access a limited number of shared resources. Now, for your programming assignment, we'll be doing, you know, palantiris. The pal palantiri will be the thing that we're going to be accessing. They'll be the shared limited resource, because there's only n of them, not m, where m is a larger number, perhaps. Um, in everyday life, my favorite example is something I experienced at grad school. I was a graduate student in Southern California, and so, of course, we we all took you know, a lot of extra time to graduate because we were playing beach volleyball and doing recreational sailing and all this kind of great stuff, things that's a little harder to do here in Nashville. But um, what you would do is you would, you know, on any given weekend, you would go down to the beaches, Corona del Mar or whatnot, and there'd be all these volleyball courts. And there were always more teams that wanted to play on the volleyball courts than there were courts for the teams. So we had a little protocol that used a semaphore-like mechanism where you would have a basket or a bag full of beach volleyballs, one for every court. And the protocol was that if you had a team that wanted, or two teams that wanted to play, they had to send a representative over to the bag of balls. And then if there were no balls in the bag, they had to wait, go to sleep, whatever, drink coffee. Uh, and uh, they would have to wait until a ball appeared in the bag. And if they had a ball, they would go and play. And when they were done, they had to put the ball back in the bag. That's basically a good example of a semaphore, right? It's a, a bag of balls that you take turns sharing. And obviously, the cool thing about this is if you end up with you know, seven balls to begin with, then seven pairs of teams can go play, right? So it allows for concurrent access up to a certain point, just like the palantiri manager and the thread, the beings that are accessing it. Unlike reentrant locks and uh, stamped locks and reentrant read-write locks and so on, operations on semaphores need not be fully bracketed. So sometimes they are. For example, in your palantiri example, they are, in fact, fully bracketed. The, you acquire a palantir you, using a semaphore. You gaze into it for a while, and then, you, then the thread that gazed gives it back. But that's not always the case. And I'll show you some examples with a uh, ping pong application that takes turns you know, playing, uh, pinging and ponging back and forth. And in that case, the semaphores are not fully bracketed. One thread acquires it, and then a different thread releases it when it's done. And they just go back and forth in, in a ping pong-like fashion. So these are really about coordination more than mutual exclusion. Something else we'll talk about is a condition object, which is a way to let um, a thread wait until some condition becomes true. And you'll see, I'll, when we talk about this, I'll give you a fun example about uh, delivering pizza. I won't talk about that right now. but. There's a fun example of delivering pizza that will illustrate how a condition object works. You always use condition objects in conjunction with reentrant locks. And so the reentrant lock class has a factory method that returns a condition object. And they always work together. And we'll talk more about that, too. A couple other things real quickly, because we'll cover these in more detail later. The next set of topics are all examples of synchronizers for barriers, barrier synchronizers. So there's something called a countdown latch that allows one or more threads to wait on the completion of operations and other threads. An example might be a, a tour guide in a museum where the tour starts at you know, 10 o'clock or whatever, and the tour guide knows how many parties are in the tour, and they don't actually start the tour until everybody shows up. Right? So when everybody shows up, then the tour starts. And maybe it's also kind of like um, another analogy of this would be in a store, uh, you can't, you know, lock the store up until all the customers have left, right? Or you, you can't, you know, turn off the lights and let out the, the guard dogs or whatnot. You have to wait till everybody's gone. So those are examples of synchronizers. And countdown latch is one example. There's also 
another example of a barrier synchronizer called a cyclic barrier. And this allows a set of threads to all wait for each other to reach a common barrier point. So a good example of this might be an assembly line where you've got a group of workers and as the cars come by, the car comes by, the group of workers descend on it and each do their thing, right? They install uh, you know, part of the engine or the tires or the mirrors or the seats or whatnot. And then when they're all done, then the car rolls down the assembly line and the next piece rolls up, right? So there's a barrier and you take, um, you have phases in which you work on things collectively as a group. There's also something called a phaser, which is a, a, flex, a synchronization barrier that's more flexible and reusable than either a cyclic barrier or a countdown latch. And the reason for that is you can end up with dynamic numbers of parties or threads that are waiting to do different kinds of things. And the analogy I always use here is if you're building a house, you may have teams of specialists who are variable in number, right? You might have you know, six roofers and 20 framers and three plumbers and so on. And those groups of people sort of descend and work together on a portion of the overall problem for a while, and it is dynamically sized, right? The roofers are not the same as the carpenters are not the same as the plumbers. So that's the phaser, and we'll talk about phasers too. In turn, you know, so, so there's a lot of stuff. Uh, Java provides you with about a dozen different mechanisms, so when do you choose which one to use? And as always, as is almost always the case in computing, there's a trade-off between productivity, in other words, how quickly can you do something, and how, how well does it, uh, what is the quality of what you produce versus performance? How long, or how long will it, or what kind of overhead or efficiency will you have? And so some synchronizers or some methods and synchronizers have more overhead. So the performance is lower, but maybe the features are better, right? So there's a trade-off. So there's a bunch of different trade-offs, which we'll talk a lot more about with respect to spin locks versus sleep locks versus hybrid locks. And, and sadly, uh, on my Mac, this isn't working, but if, if it's on my, my uh, Windows machine, the, the kitten will spin because the kitten's on the turntable. So that's a spin lock, right? So we have, um, we have you know, spin locks, things that spin. We have things that sleep. And there's different trade-offs. As a general rule of thumb, things that sleep are going to have way, way, way more overhead than things that spin, at least in terms of the overhead of shutting something down and then starting something else up or starting it back up again. Other synchronizers are harder to program correctly than others because of reasons having to do with the risk of deadlock from non-reentrant locking semantics. So some things are you know, easier to program, but they have more overhead. Some things are harder to program, but they have less overhead. So you kind of have to pick your poison. And uh, we'll talk a lot about that, and you'll get a chance to play with those things. Almost all the things we just talked about, all these classes, differ from Java built-in monitor objects. We haven't talked much about those. We'll get more into that later. Built-in monitor objects are the things that come out of the box in Java with respect to synchronized methods and this wait and notify paradigm. Those mechanisms are built in. They're part of the, the execution environment, the virtual machine or whatever. And so they're largely um, where, in contrast, the things that we just talked about are at the library level. So they're typically written in Java, whereas the built-in stuff is typically written in C and C++. As we'll see, some of the low-level mechanisms, even in the Java synchronizers, are written in native C and C++ and accessed via uh, Java native interface method calls. So we'll talk a bit in a second about compare and swap operations, and there's all kinds of other low-level stuff in this Java unsafe class. The Java synchronizers also provide way more features and more powerful semantics than the built-in monitor objects. The built-in monitor object stuff, which we will talk about at some point in the class, really is a leftover from the very early days of Java when people were trying to provide an extremely simple concurrency model that would be easy to explain and easy to implement from a JVM writer's point of view. But it turned out that it was actually hard to program when you did anything other than write trivial code. OK, so that's the end of the overview of this.